I was hot and I was tired and I was so thirsty and my muscles hurt and my feet hurt. But you know what? It didn't matter because I was helping to build a church for my new friends in Chiapas, Mexico with my students and their parents. My friends, my new friends, had lost everything. They had lived a long ways away from where we were building the church up in the mountains of Mexico. And they had houses, and they had farms, and they had pastures, and they raised crops. And then it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And the dirt up in the mountains got lots of water in it, and it turned into mud, and it ran down the mountains with all the big rocks, and it covered their homes, and it covered their gardens, and it covered their farms, and they didn't have anything. They didn't have anything. And they tried to stay there, and they tried to dig out their homes, but they couldn't dig them out because they were all covered up. So the government... Why couldn't they wash them? Because there was so much dirt and so much mud, they couldn't even dig them out. Water could wash them well, and there wasn't enough water. And so the government decided to move them to another place a long way away, and they built little tiny houses for them. Their houses were the size of my laundry room at home, just a little bit bigger. Little tiny houses close together, and they called them a colony. But the problem was that the land around their houses had rocks in it and they couldn't grow gardens. And it was hard for them to find work because they'd always been farmers and they were very sad. And then something exciting happened. One of the men was a Seventh-day Adventist and he found out that in the colony there were seven other families who were Seventh-day Adventists. And he got all excited, he said, I know what we could do. We could build a church and we could teach all these people in this colony about Jesus. But they said, we can't. We don't have any money. And that's where Maranatha got involved and that's where our school got involved and we traveled to Mexico to build a church. Now, it's hard to build a church. These blocks are really heavy and you have to lift them up and you have to put them on the wall. And then you get some mescal or mortar on your trowel and you put it on the, the bricks on both sides. And then you go get another block and you have to lift it up and put it on top. And you build the walls taller and taller and then you have to get up on scaffolding and build taller and taller. And every day we worked really hard and the people were so excited because they were gonna have a church to meet in. And then in the evening, it's like after you eat, what do you have to do when you clean up after you eat? What do you have to wash after a meal? What do you have to? The dishes. We had to do the dishes. I had to clean my trowel and get it all nice and clean. And we had to clean all the boards that had our mortar on them because they were all dried. And so we got a big barrel. And we always took our cement bags, this is a grocery bag, but we had cement bags, and we rip them apart, and we would use those bags to scrub our trowel and get all the cement off. And then they would be clean. Well, one day, we were cleaning our trowels, and we had run out of cement bags. And I was trying to clean it with my hands, but it wasn't working very well, and so I thought, I know, we'll go to one of the church members' houses and I'll borrow some rags. At our house, we have rags in our laundry room in a drawer. We have a drawer in our kitchen with rags. We have a closet with washcloths in our bathroom. And so I thought, oh, it'll just be easy to go and borrow a rag. So I got one of my students to go with me and we went and knocked on the door of their house and the husband opened the door and the wife was standing there washing her little table in her little tiny house with a dish rag. And my student asked in Spanish, may we borrow a rag? May we have a rag to clean our trowels? And the lady looked around her little house and she looked worried. I thought, oh dear, have we asked the wrong thing? And then you know what she did? 
she took that rag that she was washing her table with and she ripped it in half. And she gave half of it to me and she kept the other half. That was the only rag she had. And she thought it was so important what we were doing, building the church, that she sacrificed half of her rag for me to wash my trowel. Wasn't that a special gift? I wish I would have saved that rag so I could frame it and put it up on the wall in my house to remind me about sacrifice. You know, that's what Jesus did for us. He thought it was so important that we be saved that he left heaven where he was the highest angel and he left his heavenly father and he came down to this earth to die for us because he loved us that much. And I hope this Easter, as you're thinking about your Easter eggs and your candy or whatever it is you do, that you also think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. Thank you very much. You may go back to your seat. We have all heard of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Time passed and the day approached when the citizens were to celebrate 
Passover with a meal together. Jesus sent word to his disciples that he would keep the Passover with them, adding that he knew that his time had come and that they should gather for this, their last supper, together. and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw and prayed, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Just before they shared that first communion, Jesus said, one of you will betray me. But no one could believe it. They had all believed in Jesus' divine message, and they had all devoted their lives to Christ. But Judas had not the faith to be strong. That evening, Jesus went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. While he prayed, he asked his disciples, to stand watch, but twice they could not keep their promise, falling asleep just when he needed them.
Judas gave Jesus the kiss, a kiss which was a secret sign to the waiting soldiers. When Judas delivered that kiss, the soldiers seized Jesus and took, his, he took him away, and all of his disciples fled in fear. Jesus was delivered to Pontius Pilate, who turned to the multitude of people gathered before him and said, I will give you Jesus or Barabbas. Who do you choose? The people answered, Barabbas, Barabbas. Pilate then asked, what should I do with Jesus? To which they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate then took water and washed his hands and said, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Once again, the crowd led by the Pharisees shouted, let his blood be on our heads and on the heads of our children. the place which is called the skull. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said to them, for they know not what they do. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country with his two sons to carry his cross as they brought him to the place called Golgotha. The chief priests remembered that Jesus had promised that after three days he would rise from the dead. They commanded that the tomb be guarded, afraid that the disciples might steal the body, telling the people that he had risen. On the morning of the first day of the week, as the sun was rising, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary journeyed to the tomb. When they neared the tomb, they wondered 
who would roll this great stone away from the door. On arrival, they found the stone rolled away, and an angel told them, Jesus is not here. He has risen, just as he said. The woman, having seen the empty tomb, departed with fear and great joy. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go now and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even unto the end of the age, when his own disciples betrayed him. And when one of his closest and most trusted disciples denied him after his arrest, when he went from the cheering crowd as he entered Jerusalem to a mob yelling, Crucify him, Jesus never wavered from doing his Father's will. When it seemed as if everything had been lost and all was for nothing, Jesus was victorious. Out of the shadows, From death to life, we follow our risen Christ.
Well, I'm going to get right into uh, my message, and I always begin with the, uh, the kids' quiz, and uh, so hopefully the kids here know about it, and they've been busy uh, making sure that they are ready to answer the questions. They're right there in your bulletin, and I'll just need your help. Raise your hand, and I'll call on you. All these questions deal with uh, the time of Jesus uh, when he went to the cross. The first one is uh, a name. The name of the Roman governor of Judea who allowed Jesus to be crucified. What was his name? Yeah, Wyatt. Pilate. Isn't that a funny name? Pontius Pilate. Yeah, that was his name. Very good. Did you have to look it up or did you already know it? Oh, that's okay. Did a good job. <laughs> right, number two, another name. You know, the cross that Jesus died on was not built for him originally. He died on someone else's cross. Well, who was set free when the crowd demanded Jesus to be crucified? What was the name of that gentleman? Any of the kids here remember? All right, looks like our... Young people up in the balcony are the ones who want to do it. All right, I saw Aiden's hand first, actually. It was Barabbas. That's right. Give to us Barabbas. Crucify this Jesus. All right, number three, another name. Who carried the cross for Jesus? Those Romans, they saw a man coming in from the country, and they grabbed him, and they said, you carry this cross Jesus had been scourged too much, had not the power to bear his own cross. What was his name? I think Achaia was jumping at first, and now he started to second-guess himself. Come on, any of the young people? All right, we might need an adult to help out the kids here. This was a tough one, wasn't it? All right, is there an adult? Oh, Cheryl. Simon, very good. Lots of Simons in the Bible. Simon of Cyrene, or Cyrene, uh, it's sometimes pronounced. A province in Libya is where Simon was from, and uh, uh, some have wondered if Simon was black, and it's very possible that he was. All right, number four, and uh, there might be some confusion because I put times three by the answer, but there are three names that would be right for this uh, Question, what was the name of the hill on which Jesus was crucified? They, they actually had a name of the hill. I know you know, Howard. I want to see if any of the kids here know. And the, the Bible gives it a, a couple of different names, and then the most popular name is its Latin uh, translation. Kyle. It was not the Mount of Olives. Oh, you're just going to go down your list. Oh, Mount Carmel. No, no, Mount uh, Sinai. No, Mount. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, you're right. And I, you, you probably uh, second-guessed yourself and had it right the whole time. It was Mount Calvary. That's the Latin translation. There's another word for it. Golgotha or Golgotha. That would be its Aramaic uh, word. And in English, both Calvary and Golgotha mean... Skull. Not head, but the bone, the uh, skull. That was the name of the hill on which Jesus died. And we we've, we've know that, we've read about that. We most commonly refer to it as Calvary. Last one, this is a tricky one. It's going to take a real scholar, real intelligent young person. What did the sign on the cross above Jesus' head say? You know, the reason why most cross depictions have this upper portion is because of the sign. Probably the Romans rarely had the upper portion of the cross, but because of the uh, posting of the sign, it, it became understood that probably there was a protrusion above the cross on which that sign had to be affixed. There's a historical answer for everything. All right. Kyle, you've had a chance. Oh, Micah. It did. It said, Jesus, or this is Jesus, King of the Jews. It was written in three languages, and each of the Gospels records that sign a little bit different. Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews, or this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. 
But that's what the sign wrote. And the Jews said, no, no, don't, don't have it say that. Say that he only claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, well, what I have written, I have written. It's not going to change. The cross, the cross, the cross. Will you pray with me? Our Lord in heaven, as we come before you today, we ask that you would speak to us in a special way. We have not come here simply to hear from a human perspective. We want to hear your voice speaking into our hearts. Come in and bless us, Father. May we hear from you, we pray in Jesus' name. I think it's important that we acknowledge and recognize the solemnity and the awesomeness of discussing the topic of the cross. I don't think it should be done lightly. I don't think it should be done in jest or in a casual manner. The cross is the core of our faith. It is the science of our salvation. It is the mystery of godliness. And I imagine that even as the New Testament writers were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and as they sat down to write down the messages of the cross so that we could read them today, I imagine that at certain points their hand trembled. You know, last night we sang... Uh, one of the Negro spirituals. Um, thank you. I was looking for you. I remember the part where it says, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. I'm also reminded of, and I know I've shared this story before, but I, I think it is, is so powerful, uh, so instructional to, to the experience of that momentous period in time when Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863, was handed the Emancipation Proclamation. It was his duty to sign it into law. You, you've known this story, right? And he had spent the whole day at the White House at the New Year's celebration shaking hands. And you know, uh, men, when they shake hands, you, you, you give a good grip, don't you? That's the way you describe, you know, you give a good, if someone doesn't have a good grip, well, that says something about him. And so he'd spent the whole day shaking hands with his right arm, and his arm was quite tired, quite weak. And they handed him the Emancipation Proclamation. He needed to sign it into law. And as he lifted his hand and took the pen in hand, his hand trembled. And so he set it down. He picked up the pen again, and he went to sign it, and his hand trembled, and so he didn't sign it, and he put it down. And though people watching him, they looked on it, and, he, and, and they saw with the, the quizzical look on his face, and he said, he said, if my name is ever to go down into history, it'll be for signing this document, and my whole soul is in it. But hereafter, if those who look upon it see that my hand trembled, they will say he hesitated. And then he took one more deep breath steadied his hand, took up the pen, and as, as, as clear as day and with steady pen stroke, he wrote his name, Abraham Lincoln, signed it into law, and he said, there, that will do. The cross should cause us to tremble. We could spend all day, all month, all year, and every year after studying the cross and, and at every new revelation, at every new promise, at every new truth we discover, we could stand up together and sing a doxology of praise. We could sing a song of worship as we understand the meaning of the cross in our life. And as a matter of fact, you find that in the New Testament. It happens quite often. You're reading along in the epistles, particularly uh, the writings of Paul, and then into the book of Hebrews. He's writing about Christ. He's writing about the gospel. And all of a sudden, he breaks off and starts to go into song. 
And if you're reading it and you're trying to understand it, it doesn't make sense. You're wondering, well, this has nothing to do. And, and I remember in college, one of my professors would uh, actually pointed this out, and he commented, it, it was only when Paul had painted himself into a theological corner that he would say, oh, I'm not sure about, let's sing, let's sing. But I'd like to take a slightly different perspective on that and say it, it wasn't that Paul had, had, had somehow worked himself into a problem he couldn't solve, but as he marveled at the power and the paradox of the gospel and of the cross, he couldn't help but say, it's time to sing. Christ, he's both the lamb and the lion. He's both the savior and the Lord. He's both sacrifice and priest. He, he, let's sing. <laughs> let's sing. As he just was so overwhelmed by what the cross means to us today. The cross where Jesus was both weak and yet powerful. Where he was both showed us submission and, in, and then won dominion. Through his death, he secured life. Being in bondage, he purchased freedom. And by his agony, gave us the promise of everlasting ecstasy. How the cross is so important to, him, to us. We... Uh, We've heard the story in, in song this morning. We've, we've heard it in, in comments and in prayer. I'd like us to read the story again. I'm going to be reading from Luke 23, beginning in verse 24. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. Luke 23, 24. And Pilate released the man they were asking for who'd been thrown into prison, Barabbas. For insurrection and for murder, Barabbas was released, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And when they led him away, they seized the man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd and of women who were mourning and lamenting him, but Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, the breasts that never nursed. For then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will, the, what will happen? What will they do when it is dry? There were two others also, criminals, being led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they, know, for they do not know what they're doing. And they cast lots, dividing up those garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on. Even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was an inscription above him, saying, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hanged there was also hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering, suffering justly for we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned and said to him, truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, that would be noon, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, three o'clock, and the sun was obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God. The Roman centurion began praising God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. 
And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating upon their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. The law required a sacrifice, but it did not require a cross. The law demanded blood, but not brutality. It required death, but not disgrace and humiliation. As a matter of fact, the Jews thought that since Jesus was crucified, it automatically made his death inadequate for a proper sacrifice. You see, his his blood uh, was not handled according to the Mosaic law. And, and, and his body had not been purified according to their tradition. And, and his torturous scourging, his mocking crown of thorns, his nail-pierced hands and feet blemished him, therefore making him a, an inadequate sacrifice. Deuteronomy had taught, Deuteronomy 17, You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God a bull or a sheep which has a blemish or defect. It shall not be accepted. That is an abomination to the Lord your God. Furthermore, the Torah had taught that anyone hung on a tree in any fashion or any manner was cursed of God. Again, Deuteronomy teaches, The corpse shall not hang on the tree all night, but you shall surely bury him. And on the same day, for he who is hanged on a tree is cursed of God, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. And it's for this reason that the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mock Christ as he hung there, using the words that you can read, quoting them from Isaiah, but reading from Matthew 27, 43, they cried out, He trusts in God, let God rescue him now, if God delights in him. If he's truly not accursed, if he's truly acceptable, if he's truly the appropriate sacrifice, if God really delights in him, then God will rescue him. For he said, I am the Son of God. They use the very same language that Satan used to tempt Christ. If you're the Son of God, you can do anything you want. You could turn these stones into bread. If you're really God, then you can uh, throw yourself off the temple and the angels will come to you. If you were really God, you could take yourself down off this cross. They're not animated by the Spirit of God, clearly. The chief priests and the scribes were animated by the Spirit of the devil. But no one did delight in Jesus on the cross. Jesus went to the cross without a single friend. His disciples had abandoned him. We read about that in Mark. They fled. We remember the story of Peter denying him within the sight and hearing of Jesus himself. Luke tells us that after after Peter denied him the third time, that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Judas had betrayed him, had already gone and committed suicide. He was already hung and dead when Jesus hung on the cross. The Jews hated him. The Romans mocked him. But uh, under such circumstances, uh, a person can still uh, find serenity. A person can still find hope and trust if under such circumstances they know that at least God is with them, right? And and no matter what we go through, it's it's great to know that even God will never turn his back. God is right there with us. Though a thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right side, it shall not draw, draw nigh unto me, right? But in the mystery of godliness, as Christ hung on the cross, even God the Father would turn His back and forsake the Son. Jesus became the first of all creation to experience the horror of the second death experience. Even Satan and his angels had not realized the full extent and fury of what it means to be totally rejected, totally abandoned, totally without God. 
We read about that in the Bible. Even in the book of Job, it says, on the day when the sons of God came and presented themselves to God, Satan came among them. The book of Revelation tells us that the time came when Satan no longer had an audience in heaven. But up until this point, no one had experienced the Father utterly rejecting them. Jesus would be the first. He was the first to experience the total darkness, the sheer abandonment, the absolute damnation and oblivion of God's wrath and judgment. Christ, in that moment, had become sin. He took on his body and on his soul the sins and sinfulness of all from Adam and Eve, even unto you and to me. They were laid upon his shoulders. He had no friends, no friend on earth, no friend in heaven, friendless. But he found a friend. Even in that enormous pressure and plight and abandonment and rejection, he found a friend. The thief had at first hurled his insults at Christ along with the crowds and the soldiers, but at some point, somewhere, deep in the, th in the heart of this criminal the, and deep within his soul, light sprang into his mind and into his heart. He witnessed the patience, the peace, the forgiveness of Jesus. He heard his words of mercy towards his executioners. He saw the Lord's tender compassion toward his mother. And in the midst of that death and torment, he decided to make Jesus his friend. He rebuked the other criminal, called upon Jesus to remember him in his kingdom. And he heard the, ter the words, the tender words of the dying Savior. I say to you today, this very day, the day when I don't look like a king, the day when I don't look like a Lord, the day when I'm dying on the cross, today I am telling you, you've made a friend. We're going to be together in paradise. And I've asked the question on many occasions. I love this story so much. How close to Jesus will this man be in the kingdom? When all else turned away from him. We don't know his name or his life history. He himself said he was dying on the cross for just reasons. But in that moment when he placed his faith in Jesus, the thief was given the promise of eternal life. And then as his own death approached, I'm also amazed at, well, so much. But two things in particular I just wish to share with you this morning about Jesus. His absolute trust and his supernatural restraints. And it's found uh, partially expressed in the words of Luke 23 and 46. When Jesus, it says, as he is giving in to death, as he is releasing the spirit, it says, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, wait a minute. The father had turned his back. The father had forsaken Jesus on the cross. It was, it was necessary as part of the working out of our salvation that Jesus would receive the wrath and punishment for our sins. And it was, it was necessary and required that the Father had to turn away and forsake Jesus. And Jesus himself recognized it, crying out those words, My God, my God, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But still, my God... Still my father, 
and I still trust you. I still commit my whole life, my whole spirit. I can't see you. I can't feel you. I don't know where you are. You have forsaken me. I don't know what's going to happen. He could not see beyond the veil of the tomb, yet he cried out, into your hands I commit my spirit. Reminds me of Job when Job said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. One of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis is in his book, The Screwtape Letters. It's an allegory of demons talking together about the plans of God and the gospel coming from the enemy's perspective. You have to think of it in order for it to make sense. But he says in the Screwtape Letters, one demon speaking to another says these words, Do not be deceived. Our cause, our, de our demonic cause, is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring but still intending to do our enemy's will, that be God's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, asks why he, has been, why he has been forsaken, and still obeys. Amen. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human understands that regardless of where they feel they are in their position with God and God's position to us still says, yet will I trust you and obey. Job himself gives us a vivid description of this. I would just like to read uh, from Job 19 and I Think of it in the context of the cross. Job cries out, Behold, I cry violence, but I get no answer. I shout for help, but there is no justice. He's walled up my way so that I cannot pass. He has put up his darkness on my path. He stripped my honor from me, removed the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone. He has uprooted my hope like a tree. He's kindled his anger against me, considered me as his enemy. His troops come together. They build up their way against me and camp around my tent. He's removed my brothers from me, and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed. My intimate friends have forgotten me. Are you going to need a pep talk after this, aren't you? Those who live in my house, my maids, consider me a stranger. I'm a foreigner in their sight. I call to my servant, but he does not answer. I have to implore him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. I'm loathsome to my own brothers. Even young children despise me. I rise up, and they speak against me. All my associates abhor me, and those I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and my flesh. I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Pity me, pity me, oh, my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does? And are you not satisfied with my flesh? The words of Job echoing and speaking and prophesying the experience that Christ would feel at the moment of the utter rejection of God. But Job concludes his passage in Job 19 with the words of hope, as for me even still, I know that my Redeemer lives. He's alive. And at the last, He will take His stand on the earth, even after my flesh is destroyed. Yet from my flesh, I shall see God. The absolute trust in God that Jesus displayed on the cross is awesome. But then there's the restraint of Christ on the cross. Have you thought about it before? At no time when Jesus was on the cross was he powerless. When I was uh, young, you know, there's something about being young where you think you're invincible. And you have almost limitless energy and just no challenge seems beyond your strength and your will. And I remember uh, I had some family that, that, that owned a cabin up Chinook Pass, not too far from Whistling Jack, if you're familiar with the area. And we would go up to that cabin, my family and my cousins. And I had a cousin that was a little bit older than me, but we would hang out together and we would roam all those mountains. And, and we, had, we had hiked just a little bit beyond uh, where my aunt and uncle's cabin were. And, and we came to a cliff. 
And it was a sheer cliff. I, I, I'm trying to remember, uh, you know, it looked large. It was probably only 50 or 60 feet. But to me, as, as probably a 12-year-old boy, it just looked like it was 100 feet up there. And my cousin and I looked at each other and we said, I bet we can climb that. And I, I said, of course we can. Not a problem. And let's see who can reach the top the fastest. So we got at the bottom of that cliff using our fingers and our, our toes, not a lot of ledges. And we started scampering up that cliff. No problem. But the point came, I was about three quarters of the way up, probably only about 15 or 20 feet from the top of that cliff when I discovered I had no strength left. And when I say no strength, I mean I had no strength. And I remember clinging to this ledge and looking down. I can't jump that. Bones will break. I had so I could not even go down. You know, it takes almost as much strength uh, to go down as it does to go up on, on those types of cliffs. Now, my cousin, you know, he was a little bit older than me, and, and, you know, we were built different. He got to the top, and, of course, he helped the situation by, ha, 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 laughing. Uh, he did not know the terror that was going on in my uh, little 12-year-old frame at that time because I thought I was going to die. I could not go up. I could not go down. I had zero strength. I ended up going sideways because not too far off to the side, that sheer cliff changed into a little bit more of a sloped hill and a mountain, and I was able to scamper off to the side, and the Lord saw fit to spare little Dave Lounsbury that day, and I'm glad he did. You know, sometimes we get the idea when we see the, the pictures of Christ on the cross and we see the nails and, and we see the blood and, 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 and we see uh, that, that, you know, according to Roman tradition, his arms were also tied to the cross because nails, uh, they could still pull out. So he was both tied to the cross as well as nailed. We, we probably believe that. The crown was on. So much blood was down on the bottom. He probably, after the scourging, ha had a terrible loss of blood. And we can tend to think of it in human circumstances. And we think, he must have been powerless. He must have been exhausted. He must have been without strength. He must have been so weakened because of this experience that he had nothing left. Wrong. Wrong. He had all of the strength of his divine capacities ready to explode at any moment. He even told, he says in the scriptures, he had the power to call upon the legions of angels at any time. He could have done it. He could have called upon his divinity at any moment and thrown down the cross, abolished the mob, thrown down and overwhelmed the forces that had rose up against him. He had the power. He had every ability to do that, and it took supernatural restraint for Christ to hang in agony on that cross. We see that even as in, in the, the description of him speaking when it says that he cried out with a loud voice. Not the puny, whispering, dying breath of a dying individual, but with the strength and vitality of the Son of God, he was able to speak out with strength and with volume. Even the description of the very moments of his death show that it was not him dying as much as him yielding. To death. John's gospel puts it the most uh, graphic when it says that he cried out, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and then he died. D don't you see that it's backwards? It's backwards. When you die, then the, ha the head bows. And I have been in the presence of many who have died and it's always the same. The head is erect, unless they're laying down, of course. But if they're sitting up or anyway upright, they die, and then the head bows. 
But with Jesus, it was reversed. He cried out, it is finished. I'm now yielding to death. I'm bowing my head in full knowledge that the next moment will be death. He had to restrain himself. He had to give in. He had to surrender even up until the last few breaths that he took up, still filled with lungs, filled with air, so that he could cry out with a loud voice. He had to restrain himself for you. The great accusation of the crowd was, he saved others, why doesn't he save himself? And those who cried that did not understand, he couldn't do both. He could either save others and allow himself to be sacrificed, or he could save himself and sacrifice you and I. What power, what love, truly words cannot express the truth and the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. It will be our study. It will be our schooling. It will be our joy to contemplate and study this sacrifice even in heaven. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul penned the words, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Lord, we turn to you this morning, recognizing our great need for you. It is beyond our capacity to comprehend all of the depths of your cross where mercy and justice met and kissed. You were the answer to the accusation that Satan had brought when he fell. Is God truly loving? Is God truly just? Is His law and His character sufficient? Lord, thank You for the cross. Thank You for Your example of trust that if Your Son in such circumstances could still trust in You, what cause would we ever have to not trust you? And if, Lord, if you could restrain your power so that others might be saved, might we also follow in that example of doing everything that we can do so that others might be saved? Thank you for the cross, Lord. May it be an encouragement, a joy, and a salvation to us all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.